For Communism, an Introduction to the Politics of the Internationalist Communist Tendency. Um, I'm reading this in two parts, so this is part one. It'll be the foreword and chapter one and two. So, foreword. Today, the international working class is faced with one of the greatest upheavals in its history. By restructuring entire branches of industry, implementing technological innovation, and depressing wages, capitalists everywhere are trying to maintain their competitiveness on an increasingly globalized and vicious world market. At the same time, the bourgeoisie has utilized the collapse of Stalinism in order to strengthen its ideological campaign against the working class. They are using all means to try and discredit the idea of communism and to inject the message that there is no sense in the class fighting and defending itself. Yet the credibility of capitalist propaganda is in direct contrast to the reality of the lives of the majority of humanity. 20% of the population of the so-called advanced capitalist countries lives in poverty and need caused by unemployment. The system's capacity for destruction cannot be ignored. A growing portion of the world population suffers from malnutrition and hunger, while global agriculture produces enough food to feed a population 50% bigger than today's. At the same time, capitalist production for profit more and more wrecks the ecological resources of the planet. None of this is by accident. It is the direct result of the manner in which the capitalist system reproduces itself. Almost 150 years ago, Karl Marx wrote that capitalism comes into the world dripping from head to foot, from every pore, with blood and gore. Child labor, slavery, and slums, this all enabled the owners of capital to bring in unheard of profits. But the horrors of early industrialization are nothing in comparison with the genocide, wars, and famines that capitalism imposes on the world today. The, struggles, the struggle for communism has, as a precondition, a profound and far-reaching understanding of the mode of operation of today's capitalism. Our politics are not merely a product of our own reflections. The ideas we defend are based on the historical experience which the international working class has amassed over the last one and a half centuries of the struggle against capitalist exploitation. We stand in the tradition of the revolutionary currents of the workers' movement, begun by the Communist League around Karl Marx, down to the Third International, which was founded in the wake of the October Revolution. It continued with the minorities of the Communist left, which fought both against the, de the degeneration of the revolution inside Russia and inside the Third International in the 20s. We have always resolutely rejected Stalinist and Trotskyist currents as the product of the state capitalist counter-revolution in Russia and have politically combated them. For this reason too, for us the collapse of the Stalinist regimes represents no loss for the working class. The immediate origins of our tendency go back to the international conferences, which the Internationalist Communist Party, Battaglia Comunista of Italy, called between 1977 and 1980. In these conferences, the Communist Workers' Organization, CWO, convinced itself of the coherence of the methods and positions which the Italian comrades had developed since their foundation in 1943 and began to examine their own positions. In 1983, the two organizations founded the International Bureau for the Revolutionary Party, IBRP, on the basis of a shared platform. Thereafter, groups from other countries joined the Bureau and the IBRP became the Interna Internationalist Communist Tendency. Today, it coordinates the international efforts of the organizations constituting it. The ICT is for the Revolutionary Party, but it does not pretend to be the party or even the sole nucleus of a future party. To claim something like this would necessitate the senseless assumption that a revolutionary party could come into being through the will of a few people. 
in order to create the preconditions for the overthrow of the international capitalist system, the proletariat must take up once more the mass struggle for its own interests. We want to be prepared for this. Hence, the ICT's groups attempt to encourage the development of a solid kernel, a potential constituent part of a centralized and international proletarian world party. For those who wish to help humanity out of its present cul-de-sac, there is no other alternative. For one thing is certain, all that capitalism has to offer is a, few, is a future with a sharpened crisis, more environmental destruction, yet more human misery and yet more wars. Socialism or barbarism, there is no third way. Chapter 1 Capitalism, the basic contradictions of the system. Capitalist society, like the slave and feudal societies which preceded it, is a class society in which the dominant class lives off the work carried out by the subject class. Humanity has lived in class societies for an extremely short period of its history, and such societies are not in any sense an expression of human nature. The ICT considers capitalism to be the final class society and that the next step for humanity is the overthrow of class society itself and its replacement by a classless society based on cooperation and production for need. In previous class societies, the subject class was obliged to give up that surplus it had produced and the exploitation of slaves, serfs, and other subjects was obvious. Within capitalist society, this process is disguised. The working class appears to be free and to freely sell its labor to the bourgeois class in a market contract. In fact, as Marx showed, the working class sells its ability to work or its labor power to the bourgeois class. This labor power, when set to work with machinery and raw materials, produces a greater value than that required to reproduce it. This is the fundamental mechanism through which surplus labor is extracted from the working class by the capitalist class. Under capitalist production relations, the working class receives back, in the form of wages, only a part of the value that its work creates. The remaining part is appropriated by the capitalists, and they use this as they see fit. It is this appropriated surplus labor, or surplus value, and this alone, which provides the entire bourgeois class with its source of profit. This process operates on a global scale and profits are divided amongst the entire global bourgeois class. There is a tendency for profits to be equalized and distributed in proportion to the amount of capital each section of the bourgeois class holds, irrespective of whether the capital in question directly exploits workers producing surplus value or not. For capitalism to operate, the working class has to be deprived of ownership of the means of production. It has to become a propertyless class possessing only its ability to labor, and to have no alternative but to sell this to the bourgeois class. This separation results from the central contradiction of capitalism. On the one hand, production is social. On the other hand, control of the means and conditions of production and the commodities produced are in the hands of the bourgeois class alone. This control is used not to satisfy social needs, but to generate profits and accumulate capital. The objective of capitalist production is to produce profits. The capitalist system will only satisfy human needs if it is profitable for it to do so. It is not interested in producing products which are useful, but commodities which can be sold for a profit. The profit which each capitalist receives tends to approximate to a global average, which is dependent on the global amount of surplus value extorted from the global working class. This average rate of profit tends to fall as the value of the capital employed and the productivity of workers increases. The capitalists are thus permanently compelled to revolutionize the means of production in order to gain a temporary advantage on their competitors, and so appropriate a larger portion of the global surplus value available. 
Capitalists have to invest part of their surplus value in new constant capital, e.g. machines, buildings, raw materials, etc., in order to exploit wage labor in a more unrestrained manner. While some workers are fired, the exploitation or productivity of the others is increased. This allows an individual capitalist concern to raise its profit rate above the average. The average profit rate is determined by the ratio of surplus value to the entirety of the invested capital. The growth of constant capital at the expense of variable capital, human labor power, leads to a higher organic composition of capital, i.e. the ratio of constant capital to variable capital. Because surplus value can only be created by living labor, this curtails the capitalist's rate of profit. This does not mean that the actual mass of profit automatically decreases, but that capitalism as a whole experiences a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Capitalists attempt to counteract this in various ways. The most usual of these are by increasing the productivity of workers through more efficient plant and control of the labor process, by extending working hours, by decreasing wages, by lowering the value of capital equipment used in production. This process leads to a competitive struggle between the capitalists, which in the end brings about the periodic crises of the capitalist system. When the weaker and in general smaller capitalists establish that they are bringing home insufficient surplus value to endow their investments with new capital, they either go to the wall or they are taken over by stronger rivals. In the 19th century, this happened at a regular, roughly 10-year intervals. The crisis led to a devaluation of capital, and so to a reduction in the organic composition of capital, which enabled the surviving capital to resume and expand the accumulation process. Capitalist production became ever more concentrated and centralized. The search for cheap raw materials and, and investments in less developed areas i.e. places with a low, lower organic composition of capital, compensated for the fall in the rate of profit. In addition, this extended the world market and made the capitalist mode of production more international. Until on the threshold of the 20th century, a world economy had emerged. Imperialism. Towards the end of the 19th century, capitalist competition took on new forms. Production was increasingly dominated by giant capitalist monopolies and the great concerns of finance capital. This growing concentration and centralization of capital, which, through the class struggle, caused social problems and the need to defend the national capital, led, from the late 19th century onwards, to a tendency towards increasing state regulation of the capitalist economy. Customs barriers increased enormously in the last two decades of the 19th century. Capitalist competition moved from the level of the individual firm to that between nations. To the degree that it was drawn into the regulation of the national economy, the state placed increasing weight on military force to open up, to open up sources of raw materials and markets. Capitalism moved into the epoch of, of imperialism. Imperialism is a stage which is reached by capitalism when the organic composition is so high that the access to cheap raw materials as well as the export of capital to countries with a lower organic composition of capital is essential to prop up the rate of profit in the capitalist centers. Consequently, imperialism is not just a simple policy which the capitalists can change at their convenience. Originally, imperialism was characterized by the erection of tariff barriers and the striving for colonies, a place in the sun. Lenin was firmly convinced that colonies formed an essential component part of the imperialist system. He took it as a starting point that a process of decolonization would drive the revolution onwards and accelerate it. However, the end of colonialism in Africa and Asia after the Second World War did not have this effect. In the place of the old colonial powers, not only did new superpowers like the USA and the USSR enter into the field of play, 
but also a new form of imperialism, which some describe as neo-colonialism. The mechanisms the dominant capitalist countries use to ensure their domination are varied. The bourgeoisie of the peripheral, peripheral countries are forced in every case to play along with the existing imperialist trading and financial order. The capitalists in the periphery may not have the same access to the same mass of capital as their stronger rivals, but they are just as driven to maximize their profits. Like the rest of the world bourgeoisie, they exploit their own proletariat and also the world proletariat through capital invested in Western government debt or deposited in foreign bank accounts. The inevitable outcome of imperialism is war i.e. the continuation of economic competition by military means. An economic crisis of the 19th century type no longer devalues enough capital to set a new cycle of accumulation in motion. Only the massive destruction and devaluation of a global war can accomplish this. The real and objective task of a world war in our epoch lies in this. Of course, the capitalists do not consciously decide to have a war for this purpose. But aside from the various political or strategic justifications, it is imperialist competition itself which brings about war again and again. As a consequence, capitalism is now caught in a vicious circle of crisis, war, and reconstruction. The fact that wars have become an essential part of the system shows that capitalism long ago played out its progressive role in history. State Capitalism Capitalism entered a new phase with the, cat cat fuck, with the catastrophe of the First World War in 1914. The continual centralization and concentration of capital now threatened important sectors of some national economies. With this, the state was forced to not only intervene externally, imperialism, but also internally in order to head off the worst social and economic effects of the system. This state capitalism, like imperialism, ran through various stages. The state now began to play a role in the accumulation of capital, which was still unthinkable during the competitive struggle of 19th century capitalism. To the extent, however, that the tendential fall of the rate of profit more and more threatened the commanding heights of the national economy, state intervention became centrally significant. This tendency towards state capitalism was particularly exemplified by the failure of the Russian Revolution of 1917. The October Revolution promised a new society in which the working class would take its fate into its own hands. Because of the isolation of the Russian Revolution in a single country, in which, in addition, the working class was a minority, these hopes were not fulfilled. Private property in the means of production was indeed done away with, to the greatest degree. But this was not to socialize it, but to transform it into state property. Capitalist categories like wage labor, money, and exploitation persisted. A new ruling class, which recruited itself primarily from the careerists of the bureaucratized Communist Party, subjected the proletariat to brutal exploitation. The myth that the USSR was socialist and that statification equals socialism was one of the many illusions of this epoch. Only the Communist left reached the understanding that the USSR was a particular form of state capitalism. The idea that the state could moderate all the crimes of capitalism also led to broad state intervention in the West after 1945. This was, this, this was the age of the so-called welfare state, which was even sometimes celebrated as the solution of the social question by the propagandists of the ruling class. Even if in this phase of capitalism, far-reaching concessions could be made to the working class the welfare state was never a charity, but its entire essence was that of a repressive instrument for control and suppression. By, nationali by nationalizing beleaguered key industries, the leading capitalist powers sought to ensure that survival, or their survival. 
However, when the system's crisis of accumulation resurfaced in the early 70s, it was as a crisis of the state. The crisis. At the beginning of the 70s, the accumulation cycle set in motion by the Second World War's massive annihilation of constant capital came to an end. The crisis showed itself in the decoupling of the dollar from its value expressed in gold in 1971. To counteract the fall in the rate of profit, capital relied on the restructuring of the productive process, e.g. the introduction of microelectronics, and a massive increase in the rate of in the rate of exploitation. In the wake of this restructuring, core sectors of the industrial working class in the metropoles were heavily fragmented. Factories were shut and production shifted to low wage areas in Asia and Latin America. The flow of Western and Japanese capital to, the, to these areas strengthened. As a consequence, the factory declined as the location of proletarian experience and the starting point for resistance, at least in the West. Class composition thoroughly changed. More and more people now work in the service sector. Although most produce no surplus value directly, these people are just as exploited as other workers and are hence part of the working class. The expansion of bogus self-employment and precarious conditions of employment also makes new demands on the development of proletarian resistance. A further phenomenon can be seen in the exorbitant bloating of the finance sector. This sector appropriates surplus value produced elsewhere in the global economy. Here, in a miraculous fashion, money appears to create new value without entering the process of commodity production. The fall in the average rate of profit has led to a situation where surplus value is not being reinvested in productive capital, but is used for speculation. This has led to massive speculation in such commodities as housing, foodstuffs, energy, and so forth. This speculation and its eventual collapse are a symptom of the basic problems of the declining average profitability of capital. It does not address the causes of the crisis. It, beso it, oh, fuck. it bestows considerable gains on a handful of super rich, but in the long term, they lead to growing indebtedness, more speculative bubbles and increasing instability. The crisis in the meantime has become the longest since the Great Depression of 1873 to 96. Like preceding crises, it is characterized by many booms and even deeper slumps. It is building the basis for imperialist rivalries, growing competition and shifting alliances in which everyone seeks to place the burden on someone else's shoulders. Up until now, the ruling class has, has succeeded in preventing both decisive social uprisings as well as a complete collapse of the system. Nevertheless, this has been at the cost of a growing state indebtedness, which threatens to blow the whole system apart. The need for all states to reduce this indebtedness leads to harsher cuts in subsidies, as well as educational and social spending. Capitalism has failed, both through expenditure and cuts, to find a way out of its structural accumulation crisis. The present crisis is preparatory for a more general catastrophe tomorrow. If the capitalist system is able to continue unchecked, then humanity will once again be plunged into a world war and thus into barbarism. Communism, for this reason, is not just a nice idea, but a real necessity for, human, for humanity. The Communist Perspective The apologists of the ruling class raise their hands over the horrors of, of monopoly capitalism but always declare that there is no alternative. They admit that capitalism is not the best so social system, but then say it is the only possible one. Marxist revolutionaries who support their analyses by looking at the entire history of human development and the experiences of the class struggle are able to expose these lies. Humanity can be spared the horrors and misery of this rotten social system but only if it is overthrown and replaced by society without exploitation based on the satisfaction of human needs. 
Such a society can only be created by an international revolution of the working class. We continue to call this social al alternative communism, despite all the vilification of it by its open enemies and the manifold distortions and false interpretations of those who have worked their mischief under this label. Socialism or communism, for Marx these concepts were synonyms, is not a condition or program which can be put into practice by a party or state decree, but a social movement for the conscious overcoming of the capital relation, the doing away of the state, commodity production, and the law of value. Whereas previous revolutions have merely replaced one form of exploitation by another, the communist revolution will be the first to do away with every kind of exploitation and repression. As the sole creator of social wealth, the working class can only free itself by doing away with all classes. Communism will destroy the capitalist state and end national borders. It will overcome money, wage labor, and commodity production. Communism means doing away with the power of control of the means of production by a special class. For this reason, communism is synonymous with the liberation of the working class from all forms of exploitation. This liberation can only be the work of the working class itself. Chapter 2. The Proletariat's Class Struggle Although the economic contradictions of the capitalist system bring one economic crisis after another, the system will not collapse automatically. The overthrow of the system can only be carried out by the one class which is globally exploited, the working class. By the working class, we do not mean the abstract figure with horn horny hands and blue overalls so passionately loved by the dinosaurs of the old workers' movement and industrial sociologists. For us, all those who are dependent on a wage have no power over the means of production and are forced to perform alienated labor belong to the working class. This class is an indispensable element of the capitalist mode of production. But simultaneously, this collective producing class, which is forbidden access to the fruits of its labor, is also the grave digger of capitalist society. The capitalists understand this very well and never tire of denying the contradiction between wage labor and capital, and consequently the class struggle. In capitalist booms, we are told by all sorts of paid charlatans, the Berensteins, Burnhams, and Marcuses, that the working class no longer exists because improved living standards have embourgeoisified the workers. When capitalism finds itself in a crisis, we are told by Gortz, Hobbes, Hobbes, Baum, etc., that the working class no longer exists because the newest technologies have made it obsolete. In times of relative class peace, such theories are in great demand, but then they are always refuted by a new wave of struggle. The Economic Struggle of the Working Class as the crisis continues, the bourgeoisie is more and more forced to attack the working class. More and more people are fired because of rationalization. Unemployment is rampant. Fewer and fewer workers find jobs and those who have work are being put under pressure by harder work, longer working days and wage cuts. The working class may at first retreat in the face of these capitalist attacks but the character of capitalist production forces it, in the end, to defend itself against capitalist exploitation. This struggle can only be successful if the working class achieves the necessary unity and solidarity to drive back the attacks. The significance of such successes should neither be overestimated nor underestimated. They are important and necessary, so that the working class rediscovers both its common interests as well as its collective power as a class. But with this alone, things are not over. Every success wrung by the class in the economic struggle is important, but is, however, of temporary duration. The real defense of workers' interests demands that they proceed against the system of exploitation as a whole. 
class consciousness. Crisis-ridden capitalism is threatening humanity with further misery and the danger of a global war. But it won't collapse by itself, nor can it be essentially altered gradually. The overthrow of this system, the liberation of the working class through the conscious worldwide abolition of the wage-labor capital relation, is the basic condition for the eradication of exploitation and repression. The bourgeoisie was able to develop capitalist relations of production under feudalism by struggling for the defense of free trade and against feudal restrictions, guild laws and mercantile monopolies, etc., so that every step in the economic development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. In contrast to the bourgeoisie, the proletariat is an exploited class of collective producers. It has no system of property to defend. The communist mode of production cannot develop within the capitalist system. It first requires the political overthrow of the bourgeoisie by the conscious and active struggle of the working class. Only when the working class has deprived the bourgeoisie of power can it take on the task of the economic reshaping of society. Everything else would simply be reformism. Nevertheless, this thro throws up a series of problems. If, as Marx declares, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, how can the working class then become aware of the need to overcome capitalism? In view of their control over the apparatus of repression and their ideological domination, it appears as if bourgeois rule is almost unbeatable. So long as the capitalists more or less manage the crisis and can keep workers' struggles isolated and on the terrain of the bourgeoisie, the rule is relatively secure. But the class struggle never ceases, even if in certain historical phases it is played out at a very low level. From time to time, it openly breaks out, and under certain circumstances, it even reaches the magnitude of uprisings like the Paris June Days of 1848, the Paris Commune of 1871, the mass strikes and revolutions in the Europe of 1904 to 05, and the Russian Revolution of 1917. But revolts by themselves are not enough to overthrow capitalist rule. If the working class is not already politically prepared and has no program of its own at its disposal, the various forces of the bourgeoisie will step in and put their stamp on events with pseudo-radical rhetoric. History has shown often enough that even the workers participating can forget the lessons of their own experience of struggle if they do not have an organized political expression. The economic struggle of the working class indeed poses the problem of exploitation again and again, but this does not give us an answer to the question of how exploitation can be overcome. It is true that the proletariat is in a position to become aware of the totality of capitalist exploitation because of its role in the mode of production and its organizational capacity. In view of the dominance of bourgeois ideology, the process by which the proletariat becomes conscious is nevertheless not a linear one. In capitalist class society, the level of consciousness of the working class, because of its division into branches, groups of occupations, nations, and genders, is necessarily fragmented. There is no single or evenly formed consciousness in the class. The circumstances in which various segments of the class and individual workers develop class consciousness in different degrees and at different times allows only the logical conclusion that class consciousness can only be consolidated and further developed within an organizational framework. Only through the political organization of those workers who recognize the character of capitalism as a transient society of exploitation that is not permanent can the ruling ideas which are still the ideas of the ruling class be challenged and overcome. By politically generalizing the elements of consciousness which emerge in the daily struggles against exploitation, a political organization can contribute to communist theory becoming a material force and put an end to the bourgeois state and exploitation. Given the, do the domination of bourgeois ideology, such a conscious political struggle will not simply spontaneously develop in the daily struggles of the class. 
the organization of revolutionaries. In order to successfully carry out the struggle for socialism, it is necessary to incorporate the most conscious part of the class into a revolutionary party. The revolutionary class party can neither be an aloof circle of intellectuals nor a populist mass organization. It is the organizational expression of the conscious Marxist minority of the class. Its task consists in the evaluation and generalization of experiences and struggle and in the defense and further development of the revolutionary program. For this reason, it is an indispensable political instrument giving a political orientation and perspective. Um, for this reason, it is an indispensable political instrument giving a political orientation and perspectives to, to the struggles of the class. The organization of the communists is fundamentally different to bourgeois parties and formations. Instead of the uncritical obedience of yes men or women and passive agreement, it demands from its militants a clear understanding of the communist program, as well as the active dissemination and defense of revolutionary positions inside the working class. Even though the party must play an organizational role in the revolutionary process, its task is essentially politically defined. If, if for example, the conditions for the revolution develop, for which the embedding of the party in the class is a basic precondition, its task comprises of carrying out the corresponding preparations for revolution. Nevertheless, it should never attempt an insurrection alone and or in the place of the working class. It should not even try to do so. We reject the notion that a revolutionary party can be a substitute for the class in taking over power. The communist revolution can only be the work of the immense majority of the working class. The organs of workers' democracy will be the councils and mass assemblies, which will be based on the election and recallability of delegates. Nevertheless, these organs, in the absence of a political program which aims at the final overcoming of class society, cannot develop into true organs of, of workers' power. Such a program does not fall from the sky, but emerges from the conscious efforts of the part of the working class which has drawn the lessons of past struggles and has come together on an international level in a revolutionary world party. A revolutionary world party is, however, not an instrument of domination, but, on the contrary, a means for the political clarification and generalization of the communist program. This is a central lesson that the communist left drew from the failure of the Russian Revolution. There is no way for the working class to be free or a new social order to come about unless it springs from the class struggle itself. At no time and for no reason should the proletariat surrender its role in the struggle. It should not delegate its historical mission to others or transfer its power to others, not even to its own political party. Um, that quotation was from the political platform of the Partido Comunista International, Internationalista um, in 1952. It is unlikely that the world revolution will triumph everywhere at the same time. The task of the party is not the administration of some proletarian outpost, but on the contrary, the ceaseless work, work of spreading the international revolution. As the struggle for socialism must necessarily be conducted internationally, the party must have an international structure and presence and be well anchored in the class. The working class has no fatherland, and the same is true for the organization of communists.